Well, by popular demand, we're going to do another installment of the Balaam series tonight. Two nights in a row. I know the children are all so excited they can hardly stand it. <laughs> uh, so if you remember last time, a mere 24 hours ago, we looked at how the first meeting that Balaam had with the princes of Moab when King Balak sent to him and tried to persuade him to come and meet with Balak so that Balak could talk Balaam into cursing the people of Israel. And Balaam seemed like he was following the Lord that time pretty well, and he told them, the Lord told him, if you remember in verse 12, thou shalt not go with them, thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. And Balaam went back to, told the princes to go back to Balak and tell him, hey, I'm not coming. So now in verse 15, we'll see that Balak sends more princes to Balaam, this time more honorable princes. So he figured it didn't work the first time, so if you do more of the same, repeating the same experiment again, maybe you get different results. And he tries, and, and this time it actually was successful. But we might not even get quite that far tonight. But in verse 15, it says, And Balak sent yet again, more, uh, yet again princes more and more honorable than they. Now, Balak obviously is hoping that the presence of these prestigious men will tempt Balaam to go against the word of the Lord and to disobey God. This is what he's hoping for. He knows I mean, Balaam has told the king that God said, I can't go. Now, if this king was any kind of a godly man, any kind of a righteous man whatsoever, he would have said, okay, well, obviously, then we're not going to do this. After all, really, if Balaam is going to curse Israel and there's going to be any curse attached to it, wouldn't the curse have to have the power of God behind it? Just Balaam simply cursing him of his own power wouldn't really accomplish much. So if the king was even thinking straight at all, if God told him not to curse him, why would he want Balaam to curse him in the name of the Lord anyway? Curse Israel in the name of the Lord. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but sinners don't make a whole lot of sense. They, you know, It says madness is in our hearts while we live, and then we go to the grave. So just a practical lesson from, from this Beware of the man that tries to get you to go against what God says. When God gives you a principle to stick by in his book, and you tell somebody, no, I can't do that. If you're dating somebody, we don't really have anybody of that age here right now, but for anybody that might hear this, if you're dating somebody, and they're trying to get you to do things with them that God says don't do, and you say, no, God says I can't do that, and they say, oh, come on, it's really not that big of a deal, beware of that person. Beware of anybody that tries to get you to go against your conscience when God says no. Now, what Balak, Balak, and I, 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 I told you I listened to the recordings of, of the Bible studies to critique myself, and I listened to this one on the way down here today, and I realized that I was mixing up Balaam and Balak a couple of times. I, I take it everybody pretty much probably understood what I was saying, but if I mess it up, just point it out to me. Because the names are so similar, it's pretty easy to do. But Balak was trying to get Balaam to change his mind by bringing honorable men into his presence. But isn't that how people do things sometimes? They, if they don't bring honorable men into your presence, they might bring up honorable men. Well, so-and-so, Dr. So-and-so said this, Dr. John Gill or Dr. Matthew Henry, or I don't know if Matthew Henry was a doctor, but anyway... They'll bring up authorities. You know, and these men, good and godly men, believe these things. Certainly, they couldn't be wrong. Certainly, the entire religious world, the Dallas Theological Seminary or Bob Jones or whatever, these great men, they couldn't be wrong. They're pulling a Balak here with you. They're trying to get you to change your mind by prestigious men. But we must never honor the person of the mighty. This is what God tells us. Look in Leviticus 19 and verse 15. I like, I heard somebody else did this. I think it was Pastor Boffy one time. He was uh, debating with his Presbyterian friend. And his Presbyterian friend, I don't know if the topic was baptism or what it was, but he was saying, you know, that, that theologian so-and-so says this and so-and-so says this. And he's going on and on and quoting different church fathers and whoever. And, and Pastor Boffy says, Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but who are these? Uh -huh. <laughs> I just love that one. I've used that one before. I've, I've stolen that one before and used it. That comes there from uh, in the book of Acts, whenever the, the, um, 
the the false prophets were trying to cast out the devils and the devils and they say in the name of Jesus and the devils say well Paul I know and Jesus I know but who are ye? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, look at Leviticus 19 and verse 15. It says, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness thou shalt judge thy neighbor. So we are told, and this is both a New Testament and an Old Testament principle, that we're not to respect people based on any uh, qualities they may have, whether it's prestigious, whether it's their education, whether it's their position of authority, whether they're rich or whether they're poor or male or female. or There's no, no circumstance in which we ought to respect somebody's person based on some characteristic that they have. And this is what God is saying here. So be careful about that. With, when, when some bigwig comes and you're in his presence, you, don't wanna, you wouldn't want to show him some special favoritism that you wouldn't show to somebody else. Pastor, doesn't feminism say we should respect women and hold them up in a certain way in society and stuff? I mean, isn't there an element of well, respect the Lord being a person? That. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to mm-hmm. hold your wife up yeah. like you would yourself. Right, but, not, but because okay. you're my wife, not because you're a woman. Not women in general, just because of some property of being a woman. Mm-hmm. Oh, right. Makes right. them, yeah. you know. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Or, or mm-hmm. black people, or, or anyone, or right. white supremacists, same thing, holding someone up because they're white. Yes. But we see yeah. this a lot even in, in those And, and with affir- affirmative action type of hiring, I mean, that's exactly what they're doing, is respecting the person of the race or the gender or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And when, I mean, the Bible backs up the point that we ought to ju- everybody on his own merit. And it shouldn't have anything to do with skin color, or gender, or any such thing. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Definitely. God himself doesn't even respect persons. So if God doesn't respect persons, and he certainly, he could pick which ones he liked better or something, but we shouldn't respect persons either. Now somebody might say, well, wait a minute, doesn't God choose some and not others? And he does. God does choose some and not others, but he doesn't do it because he's respecting persons. He doesn't look and say, oh, he's good looking. I'm going to choose him to be one of my children. He's smart. She's smart. He's got a a charismatic personality. God doesn't choose us based on any good or bad qualities that we have. God's choice is not arbitrary, but it's based on His own will, His own pleasure, and it doesn't have anything to do with anything good found in us. And probably the reason for that is there's nothing good found in us. So if God would have looked down to find the good people to pick, He wouldn't have picked anybody. And we know that, right? Psalm 14, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were there were any that did good, any that did understand. It says they're all gone aside. They've all become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. But anyway, turn to Acts 10 in verse 34. Just to show you a verse, it says that God doesn't respect persons. When God does judgment and justice, it's perfect judgment, perfect justice. And he doesn't... I mean, for instance, he might not look at somebody that maybe has done some great feat of faith in their lifetime and then say, oh, well, you know, I'm going to give him a pass because, after all, he did a good job on this one. So when he's broken the law over here, I'm just going to say, ah, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to let him slip by on this one. He doesn't. And sometimes we think that. We've been through some great trial of affliction. It's like we can just ride on our own coattails throughout the rest of our life. Why well, I took a stand in the beginning of my conversion and really really lost big time there, and now I'm just going to kind of take the rest of my life off and, and, and always refer to what a faithful act I did, you know, X number of years ago. It doesn't work that way. Acts 10 and verse 34. It works that way in, in industry, too. You complete a great project at work, and you think that everybody ought to just sit there and lodge you for it for the next year or That's something. Right. I mean, yes. <laughs> and, and in truth, when the project's over, guess what? On to the next project. It, that's wonderful. And you maybe get praised for 10 minutes or so, but on to the next one. And if you blow it, nobody's going to remember what you did on the previous one. You know, in the, in the Scripture, I keep just thinking of things, but Scripture teaches the same thing. And is it I, uh, Ezekiel, I think, when it says that if a... If a righteous man do wickedly, 
all of his righteousness will not be remembered. And likewise, the wicked man, if he do righteousness, his wickedness will not be remembered. Well, what's the first thing you remember about King David? Exactly. It's his adultery and his murder to cover it up. Not all the good things, not the ten thousands that he killed or any other great things and how he was a man after God's own heart. The first thing you think about is the adultery. It says, I'm never going to get through this, but it says in, in Ecclesiastes that dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor, so doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. It only takes a little bit of folly to do what those couple little dead flies do to the ointment. You ever, heard the, you ever heard the saying of you know, a fly in the ointment? Mm -hmm. Get this precious ointment and then get a couple of dead flies in it and it ruins it all. Build up a reputation for 50 years and then commit adultery one time. Steal something one time. Lie to somebody one time and you've destroyed the entire thing. Little leaven, leaven is the full That's right. That's right. Acts 10.34 then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. You see, God wasn't respecting Jews just because they were Jews. The, he, Peter was speaking of Cornelius here, the first Gentile convert. And Peter recognizes, hey, God doesn't respect persons. God just looks at all mankind the same. And especially of his elect, he doesn't respect between Jews, Gentiles, male. It says there is male nor female, mm -hmm. Jew nor Greek, barbarian or Scythian, bond nor free. None of that stuff. There's no distinction that, that matters at all to God when it comes to his children. Mm -hmm. It's whether you're in Christ or not. That's the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. Look at Romans 2 and verse 11. Romans 2.11, this is for their, a very simple verse, for there is no respect of persons with God. Our Lord Jesus Christ had a reputation for not respecting persons. Even his enemies, when they came to him, turn to Matthew 22, verse 16. I'll try to give you the verse ahead of time. Even when Jesus' enemies came to him, and they might have been dissembling here, but the fact is still he had a reputation that they could build upon, that they could try to use to entrap him when they're questioning him. And that reputation was he didn't show favoritism to people. Look in Matthew 22 and verse 16. Here, let's begin in verse 15. It says, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him, uh, unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master... We know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth, neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar, or not? Now, Jesus didn't respond and say, hey, you know, yeah, that's right, I, I am uh, a teacher of God in truth, I do teach the way of God, but I do care for men, and I do respect persons. He didn't say that. He never corrected the man, so even if the man was dissembling, what he said was true. Jesus didn't respect persons. Jesus fairly judged between men. And so ought we. Especially if you're, an, if you're a manager or something. That's especially important. You, don't wanna, you wouldn't want to show favoritism just because somebody's good looking or somebody has a good personality or something like that. You would show, maybe show favor if they did a better job or something like that. But anyway, and as a pastor, I, and I will, I, that's probably my next point here. That is my next, well, two points from now. But I just jump ahead anyway. As a pastor, I certainly cannot show favoritism. And I'll get to that point in just a second. But the Apostle Paul, he was not affected by men who appeared to be something. He was witnessing to some Pharisees. Turn to the book of Galatians, in chapter 2, verse 6. He was witnessing to some of these Pharisees that, and I love how Paul put it. I forget exactly how he puts it. I think it, that they appeared to be somewhat. So here is men that, people in the religious world really held up in high regard, and these guys thought a lot of themselves. And when Paul was witnessing to them, he did it uh, strategically and tactfully, but he was not impressed whatsoever with these men's credentials. And neither am I. I, I honestly, when I meet somebody with great credentials, especially religious credentials, it doesn't impress me one bit. Now, if you know what you're talking about, that's impressive, but just your credentials don't mean a thing 
to me, and they shouldn't mean a thing to any of you either. Uh, Galatians 2 and verse 6. It says, But of those who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. See, Paul was confident in himself. You say, well, that's because he was an eloquent speaker with a booming voice, and he had a very um, strong-looking persona, and he was tall and muscular and very impressive-looking. That's why he didn't care about what people thought about him. That's not true. Paul was rude in speech. Paul, his bodily presence was weak. His speech was contemptible. And he still didn't care about what men thought about him. It didn't matter to him. Here are these guys that seemed to be someone. He's like, ah, whatever they were, it didn't matter a thing to me. I don't care about it. That's exactly what he thought. So anyway, that's the point there. He, he, and, and the thing is, and like I said, he went about this strategically, but he says there in verse 2, Galatians 2.2, 2, And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So when he goes up to Jerusalem and he's speaking to people that are in reputation, that maybe if he would have done it publicly around other people, somebody, it might not have worked out, Quite so well. So what he ended, what he did, is sort of took these people off to the side and did it privately, so as to not allow the effect of the gospel to be diminished. So he, you know, maybe if somebody was held in reputation, it would make sense to not talk about whatever you're talking with them about in the presence of other people, where it might diminish the effect. Maybe it is better to take them off to the side. And this is what Paul did for these people. But anyway, let's let's continue. Like I said, a man of God. A pastor cannot show any partiality or favoritism. This would be a quick way to sow dissension in a church, to breed contempt, and to have everybody hate you as a pastor. That would be a sure way to do it, is showing favoritism. Look at 1 Timothy 5 and verse 21. And that's why, though I may be friends with some of you, and I might be closer with certain some people in the church than I am with others just naturally because that's just the way that it works. I still can't show favoritism to anybody. And just because I may be friends with you doesn't mean that I don't have to rebuke you like I'd have to rebuke anybody. And that's kind of the danger that a pastor can fall into too. When you become friends with somebody, then the tendency is, oh, I'll, well, I'll just let that slide because after all we're friends. Or the person thinks, well, I can get away with more now because I'm friends with the pastor. I can't. I can never let that happen. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 21 says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. You cannot prefer one church member before another. And Christians, it's not just me as a pastor, but it's Christians in general cannot show favoritism. James specifically says we can't show favor to the rich. Turn to James 2, 1 through 9. And isn't this the tendency? Some, some guy walks into church and he's got an Armani suit on or something and he's driving a Bentley and isn't our natural inclination to say, hey, nice to see you. Wow, boy, I, we're so happy. Here, take the seat right up front. Steve, Jessica, get out of here. You know, whatever. You know, isn't that the tendency? You know, That's our tendency. But James says, no, you don't show favoritism to the rich or to the poor, for that matter. Take this nice seat on the couch here in our, in our, in our nice meeting place. Don't mind the holes in that couch. Or <laughs> All right, anyway, um, where was I? James 2, 1 through 9. It says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. This is incompatible with the Christian faith, is to have respect or favoritism towards certain people. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come also in a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, there's a good example of words that have changed meanings over the, over the years, 
the gay, with the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say unto the poor, Stand thou there, sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of, the, of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do they not blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced or convicted of the law as transgressors. So it's funny, the very people that generally were giving these folks a hard time, taking them before the judgment seats and not treating them well, they were showing respect and favoritism towards these people. Mm -hmm. Isn't that sometimes how it happens? Mm -hmm. Isn't that called uh, Stockholm Syndrome, where you start to uh, feel bad, feel, um, fa feel, have feelings towards your oppressors, to your yeah. captors? Yeah. yeah. It's kind of strange. It's weird. Mm -hmm. But that's how we are. Now, James says here that you can't have the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ with respect to persons, so Christians should be characterized by not showing favoritism, but the wicked are ones that are characterized by showing favoritism. If you look in Jude 1 and verse 16, the book right before the book of Revelation, second to last book in the Bible, Jude 1, 16, it says, These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having, having men's persons in admiration, because of advantage. There's advantage. Whenever you show the rich, when you ever have the rich in admiration, you can do so to your own advantage. There can, you, know, you can get kickbacks from something like that. Okay, so back to Balaam. Like I said, we don't want to miss the forest for the trees here. So the princes, back in verse 16, the princes again try to persuade Balaam to come to Balak. Numbers 22 and verse 16. It says, And they came to Balaam and said, Thus saith Balak the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming to me. Now as we saw there in verse 12, God had already told Balaam not to go with them in no uncertain terms. And Balaam had forwarded this information, relayed this information onto these guys. They knew that God had told him not to go with them, but they were in essence saying, Don't let God stop you from coming to Balak. That's really what they were saying. Let nothing prevent you from coming to Balak. What was preventing Balaam from going to Balak? God. God. So what are they saying? Don't let God cramp your plans here. Don't let God get in the way. Oh, you're worried about what this old Bible says. Don't let this thing stand in your way. You've got opportunities here. What are you doing this for? Why are you going to wait to find somebody of like faith? Oh, don't worry about the warnings in the Bible about being unequally yoked and things, what are you going to, you're going to miss out, you're going to miss out on life, what are, you going to, what are you waiting for? Don't ever listen to somebody that gives you bad advice like that. You know, we're told in the book of Acts in two different places that we ought to obey God rather than men. Let's look at that in Acts 4, 19 through 20. So anytime anybody comes to you and says, oh, don't let, don't let God hinder you from doing what you want to do. You just repeat the old slogan, we ought to obey God rather than men. And this was one of, this was uh, the slogan for better word, for lack of better words, of the old Walden Seas. We learned about that in the, hist in the, sermon, in the series on church history. Their, their mantra was, we ought to obey God rather than men. And it cost them <laughs> dearly. Look at Acts, okay, Acts 4, 19 through 20. So the apostles here, if I remember right, were told that they were not to speak in the name of Jesus. You know, in verse 18, it says, And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. That should have been Balaam's answer to these princes. 
whenever they said, Let nothing hinder thee from coming unto us. And he said, Well, he should have said, Whether it's right for me to listen to God or to listen to you, you judge. But I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep the word of the Lord here. Again in Acts 5 and verse 29. See, there is a time when you can say no to authority. Nobody on earth, no man on earth has absolute authority. And when somebody requires you to do something that God forbids, you must obey God rather than men. And when they forbid you to do something that God requires, you must obey God rather than men. Acts 5 and verse 29. Then Peter said, or then Peter and the apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And this ended up getting them a beating, and they rejoiced because of the beating that they got, because they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ's sake. When princes require us to do things that God has forbidden, we must deny them. And we have an example of this. In the book of Daniel, Daniel 3, 14 through 18. I think, at least this used to be, one of the favorite stories and passages for the Broyles kids. I remember the story of the three Hebrew children. I think I've heard Eric talk about this one several times around the dinner table in the past. Daniel 3, verses 14 through 18. It says, Nebuchadnezzar, so, well, let's go back. So Nebuchadnezzar had built this image, and he commanded everybody that heard the sound of the hark, flute, sackbut, dulcery, I forget all of them. Anyway, all those different instruments, all kinds of music, when they heard the, no the noise of the instruments, they were to bow down and worship this image. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow down and worship it. So here in verse 14... It says, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do ye serve, do, do, yeah, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, yeah, now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the coronet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, you should be cast in the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Listen to the pride of this man. Who is this God that's going to deliver you? He's about ready to find out who this God is. It's like King, or like the, the Pharaoh, King of Egypt, said to, the, to Moses and Aaron when they came to him. And they said, Who is the Lord? that we should obey Him. We don't follow vain words. Okay, anyway. Verse 16, Shadrach. I guess that's Shadrach. That's got a bar over A. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and He will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Listen to this. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. You know what they were saying to the king? We ought to obey God rather than men. And I just love what they say. They weren't haughty. They weren't arrogant. They wouldn't say, listen here, Nebi, I'm going to tell you a thing or two. They didn't say anything like that. They just said, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. We're not, we're not, we're not worried. We're not concerned about this. But we're just going to tell you here. God's able to deliver us from this burning, fiery furnace. But then they throw the caveat in there, which is wise. But if He doesn't, we're not going to serve you anyway. He can deliver us, but He might not. But it doesn't matter. Even if we go to the furnace, we're still not going to bow down. We ought to obey God rather than men. But here's the flip side of the coin. If princes forbid us to do something that God requires, we likewise have to disobey them. And Daniel's the example of this. Daniel 6. 6 through 10. So you have both aspects of this in the book of Daniel. Two excellent examples. These are great stories for kids. I, I would encourage 
anybody with children to teach these stories to their kids because there's a lot of great lessons in these. Daniel 6, 6 through 10. Everybody remembers the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Once again, the king, well, these people had talked the king into, this time it's the king of the Medes and the Persians, after the, the Medes had taken over the kingdom of Babylon. And the Medes and the Persians had this um, interesting system of laws that said when a law is passed, that it can never be repealed, that it's, it lasts forever. And so what they did is they talked the king into, unbeknownst to him what, what was going on, they said, hey king, we got a good idea. Why don't we make a law that for 30 days nobody can make any petition to anybody but the king? And of course, the king, the proud fool that he is, said, well, sounds like a good idea to me. So he signs the thing, seals it, and it's set in stone. And then he finds out, well, wait a minute, Daniel prays three times a day, and Daniel can't be making prayers to, the, to God anymore because the, the petitions have to be made to the king. So anyway, these guys did this to catch Daniel. So let's see what Daniel did here. Uh, Daniel 6, 6 through 10. It says, well, let me just read you what I, what I just summarized here. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said, unto the, and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdoms the kingdom, the governors, and the princes, and the counselors, and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of the O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing, that it may be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, O king Darius, or wherefore, king Darius, signed the writing and the decree. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and closed up all the windows and hid in the closet and made his prayer to God so that nobody would see him. Is that what it says? Is that what he did? He was afraid? He's afraid of the law? And then he goes into hiding? No. What does he do? He went into his house and his windows being opened, his chamber toward Jeru- in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. You know what Daniel did whenever the, whenever the tide changed, whenever the laws went against him and he was in danger of his life? You know what he did? The same thing he had always done. You know what we're going to do? Whenever the government one day says that it's illegal to be a member of a non-state sanctioned church and to worship Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth, you know what we're going to do? I'll tell you what I'm going to do anyway. As I did aforetime, I'm going to do the same exact thing that I've always done. That's what I'm going to do. That's what we all ought to do. We ought to obey God rather than men. So Balak then, he goes to Balaam and he promises to promote him to very great honor if he would just disobey God. That's all you have to do. Just just disobey God. Just this one little thing. It's not really a big deal. You just have to come here. Just curse these people for me. I know God said no, but just this one little thing, and I will promote you to great honor. What do you suppose was inspiring Balak to say these things? Remember what happened to Jesus after he was baptized? And the devil tempts him. And the devil says, all the kingdoms of the world are given into my hand. All you have to do is just fall down and worship me and it's all going to be thine. Isn't this what Balaam, or what Balak, pardon me, is saying basically? I'll promote you to great honor. All you have to do is disobey God. How many times has that happened in people's lives? All you have to do is just break this little commandment and great things are going to happen. We're going to promote you at work. You're going to be able to find the perfect husband, the perfect wife. You're going to finally have that marriage that you wanted or whatever it could be. Any number of things. Numbers 22 and verse 17. He says, For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me, this people. Now here's the deal. God promises that those that honor him will be honored, but those that dishonor him will be lightly esteemed. So maybe Balaam would have been honored. Maybe he would have been made to great honor, but guess what? God would not have honored him. Mm-hmm. Now, which is more important? Mm-hmm. Do you want God's honor, or do you want the praise of men? Let's look at a verse here that 
says what I just said. It's 1 Samuel 2 and verse 30. 1 Samuel 2 and verse 30. I remember when I was going through a very difficult time one time and my pastor gave me this verse and told me that God honors them that honor Him. And just to hold in there, hold tight, and God will bring you through it and He will bless you for it. And he was right. 1 Samuel 2 and verse 30, Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house, he's talking to David here, and the house of thy father should walk before me forever and now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and them that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. I think he was talking to David. Or was he talking to... He might not have been talking to David. I think he was talking to Samuel or... Anyway, I'd have to look back there. But the point is, God will honor them who honor him, regardless of who he was actually talking to. Was to Eli. Eli, was he? Well, thank you. I knew I invited you to this Bible study for something. Oh. <laughs> now, King Balak, though, promised Balaam just the opposite. He's saying, hey, just dishonor God, and you're going to be honored. But God is saying, you honor me, and you'll be honored. You dishonor me, you disobey me, and you're not going to be honored. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Look at Psalm 118 and verse 9. Psalm 118 and verse 9. We looked at this verse yesterday. It says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. So who are you going to trust? When a prince comes to you and says, Hey, just disobey God and I'm going to promote you to great honor. And God says, Disobey me, you're going to be lightly esteemed. You're going to put your trust in God? You're going to put your trust in men. Look at Psalm 146 and verse 3. It says, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. Now, even if we would get honor from men, there's nothing worth disobeying God for. Remember the cardinal, the chief commandment? It's to love God with all your heart, strength, mind, soul, right? That's the chief commandment, Matthew 22, 37 through 38. So there's nothing worth disobeying God for. It doesn't matter what it is. And you know what? Even if it causes you to suffer, it doesn't matter. It's still worth obeying God for. Because in the long run, even if you don't get rewarded in this life, one day God's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It's going to be worth it. If not now, it'll be worth it someday. The way to honor and exaltation is by humbling yourself, not by proudly disobeying God. If Balaam really wanted to be honored, he wanted to be elevated to a high position, the way to it is through humility. It's through doing what God says. Look at James 4. And we're almost done. I know everybody's tired. And don't get mad at me. It wasn't my idea. It was somebody else's idea. James 4, 6 through 10. James 4, 6 through 10. Here, you want to be honored? You want to be brought to great estate? Here's the key to it. James 4, 6, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In verse 10, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. James 4, James 4, 6, and 10. So the way to exaltation is just the opposite that we would think it is. It's to humble yourself, to think low of yourself, and then God exalts you. We don't normally think that way. We think the way to exaltation is to promote ourselves, to tell everybody how great we are, to show everybody what a great person we are, all the great, wonderful things I can do at work or elsewhere, and that's going to get me promotion. That's not what God says. God says, humble yourself and he'll lift you up. 1 Peter 5, 5-6 is a good um, comparison text with this one. 
First Peter 5, 5 through 6. It says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. This is what Balaam should have done. Obey God, and God would exalt you. Just the opposite is going to happen to Balaam, though. I don't think he's exalted right now. The midst of darkness is reserved for him forever. See what happens when you listen to kings that try to tell you to disobey God? Honor comes by humility and the fear of the Lord. Look at Proverbs 22 and verse 4. Proverbs 22 and verse 4. It says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. I love it. What did Balak tell Balaam that he would give him? Riches, silver, gold, honor. All the things that everybody wants, right? Power, prestige, wealth. Isn't that what everybody wants? Notoriety. Well, this says it's by humility and the fear of the Lord. You want to get all that stuff? Okay, humble yourself and fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to depart from evil, the Bible tells us. So, fear God, keep His commandments, and you will be honored. You will be lifted up. If not now, remember, remember, remember the parables when it says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful with a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. It will happen someday if it doesn't happen now. Never believe the person who promises to honor you for disobeying God. A godly person only honors someone who fears God. And I'll leave you with this one. Psalm 15 and verse 4. Anybody that would promise to honor you for disobeying God is not a godly person and therefore should not be trusted. Psalm 15 and verse 4. This is talking about the godly. I'm just going to read the whole entire psalm. It's only five verses. It says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Not only in his mouth, but in his heart. He even thinks the truth. He doesn't even lie to himself. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, and he, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord, he that sweareth to his own hurt, and changeth not. You see here, the man, the, the godly man, honoreth them that fear the Lord. So anybody that promises you honor for disobeying the Lord is not a godly man. So next time we'll get back to verse 18 when we see Balaam's response to Balak. And the response, once again, Sounds pretty good. Balaam, he, he spoke a lot of righteousness. He just didn't do a lot of righteousness. So anyway, thank you for your kind and patient attention tonight. How long was that? 43 minutes. I told you 40. That's close. You round down. Three rounds down to zero. 40 minutes. All right. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome.